would be helpful for me too. Okay, so I've got that recording now. And then I'm going to talk a bit about the five capitals as a kind of way of seeing, of framing how we do church. And I'm really, ref the, the book, there is a book on that stuff, which is uh, called e uh, Oikonomics, uh, which you can get off Amazon or whatever, which was, that's the 3DM book. It's just uh -huh. a little book, um, if you're interested in taking that stuff further. But I'm not really specifically talking to the stuff that book deals with. I'm really speaking from my own experience. So um, my background is that I was um, a young adult at the church in Sheffield where Mike Breen started all this stuff back in the 90s. I met my wife there and we were both uh, worship leaders there at that church. And then um, when Mike started teaching about missional communities and life shapes, all those tools, those sorts of things, we really went after that stuff. Um, and then later I trained, mm -hmm. I went to seminary, trained to be a pastor. I was a high school teacher originally. Um, and when Mike left that church in 2004 to come to the States, I became the senior pastor of the church there and led that for 10 years. Um, during that time, we really mm -hmm. saw the missional communities grow and, and kind of uh, flourish. And um, we ended up with about 100 missional communities across the city, which was fantastic. Probably about half of which were with um, kind of under 30s. So young, a lot of young people involved in those. Um, mm. and we started... Uh, uh, Mike Breen started 3DM over here in the US and I started 3DM Europe over in, in, in Europe. And then um, in 2014, um, when Mike decentralized um, 3DM basically, um, and he asked me to come over and he's now retired um, from leading 3DM. He's doing other things. And uh, so I, I kind of head up the national team for the, well, the team for the US and for Canada for 3DM. So I work with a team so Gina is a hub leader and is based around hubs around the country. And uh, there's about another five or six hub leaders and I work with them to help them build out what they're doing, support them really. Um, so that's my, that's my job. So I do that probably um, about half the week. And then the other half of the week, I'm partly employed at a church on their team and partly um, also lead a network of churches in our own region who've been through the whole process and kind of want to stay on the journey together. So we have about I don't know, 30 or so churches in the kind of Ohio, Michigan, uh, Indiana kind of region that are, um, that are kind of just, they've done the learning community, but they've decided they just want to stay on the journey together and kind of relate to each other. They're all from different denominational groups. But uh, I think you find if you take your church on this kind of journey, it's a long haul. It's, it's not an easy journey to go on. Um, it's a very rewarding journey long term, but there are some... Um, I think, you know, there, there are some health warnings. Um, there, I, my experience is that the enemy, particularly, you actually begin to discover a, a spiritual warfare at a whole new level when you try and build something movemental and missional out of your local church. I think the enemy seems to be content to let churches get on with what they're doing if they're basically just, uh, you know, teaching people on a Sunday and providing, you know, good worship, nice donuts after the service and good Bible studies during the week. I think once churches start trying to really set themselves on um, trying to build a multiplying movement of mission and discipleship, it feels like the whole spiritual warfare component, you know, steps up. So if you are going to go after this stuff, um, Kevin, I definitely recommend that you um, make sure that you've got a good kind of prayer cover. You know, you've got, you personally as the senior pastor have got plenty of, you know, several people praying for you regularly and that um, you make sure that as you, begin to build the kind of uh, commitment in the church amongst your people to mission and discipleship that you are also kind of building the prayer life in the church to make sure there's kind of proper spiritual covering as you do those things. Mm -hmm. and I think you'll be aware where you are of the things that some of the things that happened at North Heights. I mean, that would be the worst example of that kind of stuff that we've seen probably in the U S but um, uh, there's been one or two other churches where similar things have happened, you know, where, where, um, there's kind of a very violent reaction against the kind of culture that's being um, trying that we're attempting to build. So, you know, um, it's not without its challenges. So I, I don't want to, I don't want to oversell, you know, so it's not all, it's not all just uh, fun and games. There is the, I think you've, there is a sense of you really entering a spiritual battle when you do this stuff. And that's partly why we have these networks of folks who've done it. Cause a lot of the churches on the journey kind of feel like, well, we actually want to stay connected with other churches doing this stuff so that we've got some, accountability and some uh, support and some friendship with folks who get what we're trying to do you know so um, I don't want to I don't want to um, you know I don't want to overplay that stuff but I think it's it, there is a, a reality about that kind of stuff
So, um, yeah. So, so I'm going to just put up a whiteboard if that's okay. And, um, okay. and I'll put you up at the top so that I can see the whiteboard and I can still see you. So, um, really um, what we what we're thinking about with this um webinar is um we're thinking and and uh, i'm aware some people will be watching this um on the recording so um if you are watching this on the recording and you want to um come back to me with any uh, questions um then uh, please feel free to do that and uh, you can email me on uh, paul mcconaughey at uh, 3d movements.org i'm just going to turn the brightness down a bit on my monitor because it's reflecting a lot on, on me is better um, and um, so uh, do get in touch with me if uh, if it would be helpful um, to have a bit more of a kind of email conversation about these things um, but but basically what we're one of the things that we deal with with 3dm a lot is we deal with um, an expectation that churches have um, on their pastors and their leadership teams which um, we would contend are not particularly biblical so um, for example, um, if you were to draw the church like this as um, a kind of sphere, um, uh, there's, a, there's a kind of social contract in most churches, often not written down, but just kind of assumed, um, which kind of looks something like this. So here, the, in this picture, the outer shell would be the leadership. Oh. Um, would be the leadership of the church, um, and the and inside the um, in, inside the circle would be the people of the church, and um, this is what I would call um, a pastoral a pastoral model. And really, um, what's going on in the pastoral model is that people um, they 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 kind of if you did a kind of mind X ray of the people in the church of what they wanted, it would be something like we want to be. Um, we want to be fed from God's word. Um, we want to be looked after pastorally um, while we try to be good people in a bad world. So there's also a little bit of a, a little bit of a kind of separatism often about those churches. You know, one of the ways we need to engage with the world um, is to kind of avoid it as much as possible. And so, um, in many in many churches, um, that's the unwritten um, kind of social contract. Is our job is to turn up on a Sunday, listen to your teaching, um, and to uh, if we're highly committed people, to also um, do some tithing and to um, commit to support you know in a voluntary capacity to support various programs of the church. And your job as the pastor or as the leaders is to feed us from God's word and look after us. Um, and this is something we've talked about sometimes in, uh, in 3DM. We've, we've talked about that as being a form of spiritual feudalism. And I think there's a challenge, uh, as a European speaking to Americans, there's a challenge to America in that, um, in many ways, America was formed as a reaction against feudalism. Uh, you know, the idea that you live on someone else's land and that you pay them taxes from the crops that you raise, and then in return, they look after you. Um, you know, America was very much formed by people saying, we don't want that. We want to actually take responsibility for our own land and for our own lives. And we want to live our lives before God as people who take you know, responsibility. And, um, and it's strange because in some ways you could argue that the, the church is one of the least American things about America. Because it's, <laughs> it's, one of the, it's one of the few areas where people don't really take responsibility for their own vision and for their own life. They want the pastor or the team to take responsibility for them. And in that pastoral model, People don't really even take responsibility for missions. What they do is they take responsibility for um, giving money to professionals, professional missionaries, and then those people can take care of the missions for them. So, so um, that's the pastoral model. And one of the jobs that we have is we're trying to um, build a, a model of church, which is about spiritual capital, um, is we're trying to take the church on a journey um, where... Um, it would look a bit more like this. Um, I'm just trying to, um, perhaps I'll do just a kind of great, I'm trying to say that it's a, a slightly less definite circle. Um, and, uh, and instead of being around the outside, the, the staff and the, uh, and the leaders are kind of at the center 
and um, and what they're doing is um, they're ministering to the church in a way that's designed to um, in a way that's designed to equip and resource and train them. So this model, the leaders are here. Um, oh, I don't want to do that in a clearer colour. So the leaders are there and they're equipping the church. And um, this is what I would call a missional model or even a movemental model. And um, here, if you were doing a kind of uh, mind x-ray of the people, they would be saying, uh, we want to be uh, resourced, equipped, trained as we give our lives, well, as we look after each other and give our lives to the last, the least and the lost. Um, and so um, it's not that in this model that, for example, we don't have any pastoral responsibility as a, as a leadership team, we do, but our pastoral responsibility is not to individually look after each member. Our pastoral responsibility is to, um, uh, is to uh, make sure that the structures and the training is in place to help people to look after each other. So um, the way that we did that in, in the UK was that we... Um, we had a system of pastoral care that went through small groups and mid-sized groups, missional communities. And then um, we also had centrally various pastoral ministries that were kind of back up to that. So for example, if somebody had pastoral issues that were too difficult for their missional community leader to um, help them with, then the missional community leader could then refer them to say some extended prayer ministry or things like that. But it all came through the small groups and missional communities. So the primary emphasis, so for example, if somebody somebody is in hospital, they wouldn't necessarily expect their pastor to come and visit them. They would expect multiple members of their community, of their missional community or their small group to come and visit them. And the pastor, um, would, their job would be to make sure that that's all happening and that there's um, appropriate care is in place, but not necessarily to do it themselves. So I'm just going to, um, I, we, we've just, uh, we started with a bright sunshine outside while I was up with you, so I drew my blinds and we've now gone to a heavy storm outside, so it's all suddenly gone very dark. I'm just going to, put a bit more light on the situation, so I'll be one second. Hang on. Thank you for bearing with me. It's classic Indiana, they say if you don't like the weather, wait 20 minutes. So, uh, so yeah, so um, one of the things that we're trying to do on this 3DM journey is we're trying to, we're trying to help churches to, to go on a, a journey where they're changing the social contract between, um, between the people and the church. And if I was to kind of put a, an overall kind of um, principle on these two things, um, I would say that this one is love from a distance. Um, and uh, this one, and by, by, that, um, by, by that, I mean, People want God to bless them, and they want to have um, some level of interaction with God, but honestly, God's a bit scary, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pay the pastor, and the pastor can um, the pastor can go and seek the Lord for me all week, and then give, give me the blessings of God on a Sunday, and I don't have to get too close to God, you know. I know that I'm called to be a brother and sit or sister to my fellow Christians, but honestly, they're a little bit difficult, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll do it, but I'll do it within programs i'll use programs to limit the time that i'm connected with them so i'll be a brother and sister uh, brother or sister to my fellow christians on a sunday morning and between seven and nine on a wednesday night for the rest of the time for my own time and in terms of missions it's kind of like rather than actually sharing our life with people who don't know the lord i'm going to just give money to missionaries and they can do it so it's kind of love it is love it's if you like it's kind of what you could call um an intervention approach an interventionist approach 
I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to from a distance intervene to, to connect and then step back out again. Um, and what we're trying to do instead is um, is move people to um, to loving each other um, through shared lives. Um, uh, with the Lord, so the Lord doesn't want to love us from a distance. He wants to move in, you know, um, uh, fully into our lives. Um, he wants us to seek Him, to spend time with Him, uh, both individually and together with others, um, with uh, with each other. Um, we sure we have programs. Programs serve us, but if the program the program shouldn't be limiting our interaction, they should be uh, putting some regular predictable patterns into our interaction. But we should be seeking to you know, be living lives with each other uh, in, a, in a much more connected way so that we're functionally more like brothers and sisters and less like cousins. You know, I mean, cousins, mm -hmm. um, you know, they've got each other's back, they love each other, but they just see each other at formal functions usually, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And in terms of mission, that we're recognising that although we have a responsibility to support professional missionaries, that doesn't absolve us of the responsibility to get our own hands dirty and that we're supposed to be reaching out to people who don't know Jesus too. And I would say that this is... Um, this approach, you could call this um, incarnational. So I think that God likes intervention, using these use terms in this way. Um, you know, if we, if we have only ever been taught that the option is either you do intervention or you don't, then obviously doing it is better than nothing. But I think that actually God has a preference for incarnation. You know, I love Eugene Peterson's version of uh, John 1.14 where he says, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighbourhood. That's what we're talking about. And that's the, so that's the kind of underlying philosophy behind the whole missional community movement is we're trying to move that way. I think it's very difficult mm -hmm. for pastors because um, for a lot of pastors, um, their churches um, uh, don't, wouldn't even recognise, wouldn't even realise they're operating with a pastoral model without even realising that's what they do. They're just doing church the way they've always done it. And so... Um, you know, there is a challenge for us there because partly we have to um, help people to become aware of these things before they can, um, before, before we can help them to change it. So, mm -mm -mm. Yeah. so before we move on and start talking specifically about the, um, let's start sp talking specifically about the uh, spiritual capitals, any, any comments or thoughts on that, Kevin, any, any kind of questions about it? Uh, no, um, um, makes a lot of sense and uh uh i think yeah it's changing the sense of uh, the mindset and expectations of members as to uh what they're thinking the church is about and what what's expected of them you know that's a paradigm kind of shift and i, I do think it connects very strongly with um, um the millennial generation in, in particular of uh wanting to you know, so wanting to be a part of a community uh, that is more missional, is uh, yeah. more engaging than simply an institution, you know, so. Absolutely. And, uh, and I think one thing we've, we've seen from millennials as well is they're really looking for a, a greater level of authenticity. You know, they, mm -hmm. they want what people say and what people do to match up, which I think is a challenge to us in the evangelical church, because I think we've focused for years more on what people say than on what we actually do. You know, um, and so, you know, it's orthodoxy rather than orthopraxy, um, you know, uh, has been the, the thing. As long as you believe the right things and say the right things, then you're one of us, rather than kind of, you know, the parable of the wise and foolish builders. Jesus is saying it's, it's not what you know, it's what you do that really shows whether you have wisdom or not. So I think that's one of the challenges there, isn't it? Not so much necessarily for the pastors, but for the members of the church. It's like you can't outsource the Christian life. It has to be something that you're taking on yourself in all of the mm. different dimensions so okay well we'll um i'll just clear that board um okay and uh we'll um i'm just going to uh i'm just gonna put up the spiritual capitals and um, one of the one of the outworkings of this of this kind of shift of culture that we're talking about is that um uh we're used to um, the credentials for our leaders um, coming from their intellectual capital. So um, obviously capital comes in different forms. Obviously, we usually, when we talk about capital, we mean finances. But of course, finances is only one kind of wealth. There are all kinds of wealth. If you or I were dressed in rags 
and dropped in the middle of a shanty town in a developing uh, world country, um, we still would be immeasurably wealthier than all the people around us um, in many ways. Uh, not socially, because they would have lots of social contacts in that shanty town, but um, pretty much in every other way, you know, we, we'd still got a net, we'll st we'd still be educated, we'd have citizenship of a developed country, we'd have ways to contact, um, you know, people who can help us and all sorts of things. So, you know, um, uh, finances are not the only kind of wealth. And, and, um, and, w and we know that's very true in many ways as well. For example, um, you know, um, if, uh, if, uh, if Donald Trump um, offered me his entire, it, all of his finances and all of his power in return to swap families with me, I wouldn't do it because I love my family very much and they're worth more to me than those things. So for me, my relational capital is worth more than his financial capital would be, you know. And so there's the, so capital is just, uh, you know, there's lots of different ways of thinking about capital, aren't there? And we've used that as a tool to really think through what we do. And, um, and, and actually, when you look at the way that Jesus functioned, um, we would suggest that there were five primary capitals that Jesus um, developed um, in his ministry. And I'll just put them out first and we, we can talk about them. So um, first of all, he developed spiritual capital. Then he developed relational capital. Uh, then physical, oh dear, I'm, uh... and then um, intellectual capital, and finally, um, really not so much Jesus, but the disciples as you get into Acts developed a model for uh, financial capital and um, the suggestion would be that um, these capitals are valued um, by the world in in uh, starting with financial capital as the most important and spiritual capital as the least important so the world tends to operate that way to the point where they'll talk about how much money you've got as your as your net worth or your, you know, what your worth means, how much mm -hmm. capital have you got? Um, and our contention would be that um, the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of God, the capital's value is actually exactly the opposite. So it starts with spiritual capital and financial capital is probably the least um, important of the, of the five. And I, I just want to talk through um, the model that Jesus used for practicing ministry, primarily from Luke, um, although with, um, from John as well, from John's gospel as well. Um, uh, just to have a think about how he did this. So Jesus has done his um, 30 years or so of just living his life. And um, there's quite a lot of development of spiritual capital in that because obviously he's lived 30 years where he's been clothed in flesh, which has fleshly desires and he's he's never once said yes to any of them so he's you know he's um he's resisted temptation and um and hasn't succumbed to temptation once so he has already has very significant spiritual capital in terms of integrity um and purity um but it's interesting when he starts his um his earthly ministry his three three-year ministry the first thing he does in luke 3 21 to 23 is he gets baptized and uh, when John says to him, I shouldn't be doing this, you should be doing this with me, he says, this is necessary for me to fulfill all righteousness. So he's, he's going after spiritual capital. And then, of course, straight after um, having his baptism, uh, the Holy Spirit, it says he's full of the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit takes him into the desert, Luke 4, uh, 1 to 14. He has the three great temptations, um, which um, Arrhenius um, suggested was um in, in his kind of recapitulation um theory of atonement um Arrhenius said that what was going on there was that um jesus was operating as the second adam and wasn't just going through three temptations that were particularly difficult for him but was instead entering into the great defining temptations of humanity so um 
the, the, the three great temptations there being appetites, um, turn the stones to bread, um, ambition, all the kingdoms of this earth, and approval, jump down from the temple and let the angels make you float and do your grand entrance. So, um, uh, you know, that we, we found that a helpful uh, way of processing what Jesus was doing there. It feels like he was dealing with those three great temptations that all of us, most of the temptations that we face are uh, different combinations of those three kind of key ingredients. Uh, and, um, and what um, Irenaeus did, said was, he said they related to the three great blessings of Genesis on Adam and Eve in the garden. So God blessed them, mm -hmm. approval. He gave them all of the seed bearing plants to eat, um, a, a bun, an abundance of food, uh, appetites, and he made them to rule over creation, um, ambition. And so those great, those three things were lost um, in the fall. And so there's these, there are these echoes of Eden in our hearts. That means that we're constantly wanting to regain those three things. And so um, instead of regaining them uh, through uh, God, we try and regain them in our own strength. And that's the, uh, that's the great temptation. And of course, that's what um, Satan was doing with Jesus. He wasn't offering Jesus anything Jesus wasn't going to get eventually anyway. Um, but the point was he was trying to get him to do it in his, own, in his own earthly strength rather than to do it the way his father wanted him to do it. Um, he was trying to get him to short cut, cut um, and not have to go to the cross, really, wasn't he? And Jesus uh, resisted that. So it's interesting that in Luke 4:14, 4, Jesus, it says, in Luke 4, 1, it says, Jesus went into the desert full of the Holy Spirit. Having been through that process, it says in Luke 4:14, 4, he came out of the desert in the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's a classic picture of Jesus valuing and developing spiritual capital before anything else. And of course, the very next thing that happens in Luke 4, um, you know, uh, it, for, certainly um, after he's been rejected he does get rejected at Nazareth but um, basically I mean the, the last portion of Luke 4 is all about signs and wonders it's about Jesus demonstrating massive spiritual capital um, supernaturally um, uh, so Jesus starts by developing spiritual capital and then the next thing he does as people are attracted to him because of the spiritual capital is he develops relational capital so by Luke 5, just let you know, just by the next chapter, um, uh, he's, he's got the calling of the disciples. And so he then starts to build a community around himself, a core team, and he starts to disciple them by helping them to see what he's doing and to imitate what he's doing. And, um, and uh, relational capital, um, uh, you know, which is built through friendship and discipleship. But the discipleship model um, in the New Testament um, is the same model, whether it's through the Jewish eyes or the Romano-Greek eyes. And Paul shifts from using the first to the second cultural reference. Um, you don't really see, you stop seeing, for example, the use of the word disciples after about Acts 21. Um, and that what's going on is that Paul is moving from um, uh, the, the rabbinic uh, model of discipleship, which is that you you become a disciple. You, as they said, walk in the dust as a rabbi. You live with the rabbi. You probably become a disciple at the age of about 12. You're taught by the rabbi and you live with the rabbi and do everything with the rabbi up until the, about the age of 30, so about 18 years. And then you are recognized as a rabbi in your own right in the school of thought that your rabbi was in. So Paul did that with Gamaliel, for example, and then he's recognized as a rabbi in that, in, in that school. And then... Um, <coughs> and, uh, the thing about that is that, um, you know, there's this huge imitation phase and, um, and uh, that you can't really build the relational capital and the disruption that's necessary unless you're prepared to do some element of shared life with people and um, certainly to do team with people. Um, uh, and we tend to, with our discipleship in the West, to give information, have a book, go to, this, go to the conference, and then people go away and innovate. And um, actually the model of discipleship in the Bible is, in, is information is fine, but then you have imitation before you can go and innovate. So information, imitation, innovation. Um, and of course that follows through with the Verano Greek model, which was that you had a pedagogue in a wealthy home anyway. You'd have a servant or a slave who would teach children basic etiquette and behavioral stuff. That's the pedagogue. Or um, Paul, um, it's translated, you know, um, uh, as uh, guardians you have 10,000 guardians but only one father and then at the age of 12 to 14 something like that 
Um, the boy spends all his time with his father, the girl all the time with her mother. And again, they go through that long imitation phase. In fact, the Romans even had a had particular patterns of toga that um, you would wear that would show that you're in that phase where you're imitating your, your father. Say your father was a magistrate, you might stand at his right hand all day, every day for 15 years, listening to every decision he makes. And, and then there comes a point where uh, you're considered ready to be a, a magistrate yourself. And so either way, you know, Paul is saying, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So there's this, you know, uh, Peter and John say to, uh, sorry, um, James and John say to um, Jesus, uh, what are you doing, Rabbi? And he says, why don't you come and see? So there's this shared life component of building relational capital. So he built his core team. Mm. And then as he begins to build out what he's doing, in order to get the impact that he's looking for, he needs to put more boots on the ground. So physical capital in, in our personal lives might include things like physical health and things like that. But um, in movemental terms, it's often about actually increasing your ability to actually make things happen. So for Jesus, I think that was not just about building more close relationships, but it was about building the number of people on the ground who are actually prepared to do this. So you see, for example, in Luke 9, the sending out of the 12. In Luke 10, you see the sending out of the 72. So now Jesus is sending out 72 people in twos to every town and village he's about to go to before he gets there. So he's building this, uh, he's building this um, physical, uh, uh, this ability to physically do much more than he had before. Um, and it's interesting because it's really only, I mean, he does teach in all the way through the Gospels, but the really key kind of teaching dialogues um, come towards the end of the gospel so you think about um john's gospel just shifting from luke to john there i mean john 14 to 16 is the is the really you know it, it's the time where he actually explicitly says in john 15 he says i used to call you servants but now i call you friends because everything the father's made known to me i'm making known to you so um he's beginning to give them the kind of explain what they've been seeing it's like they see it first they share life with him, but then there comes a point where he explains a lot of detail and begins to, to build their intellectual understanding. And, um, and then Jesus doesn't really deal with finances um, during his uh, three-year ministry, except to say, you know, seek first the kingdom and everything else will follow. All these other things that you need will follow, i.e. Um, financial capital is at the bottom of the, of the spiritual capital's pile. If you, do, if you attend to the other things, that will take care of itself, particularly spiritual capital. Um, the Lord will take care of you. Um, but you do see a financial model beginning to emerge in Acts where Paul develops what we would call the give, share, make model, or the, uh, not just Paul, the disciples develop that. So, for example, in Acts 2, 42 to 47, you see the um, disciples sharing what they have, and so there were none who were needy among them. Um, in Acts 11, 27 to 30, you see Paul um, and Barnabas being sent to um, take a gift. You know, do you remember when Agabus the prophet prophesied there was going to be a famine? And so they decided they were going to send a gift to the church there to help them. So there's giving. And then you have in Acts 18, you have Paul with, um, with uh, uh, Priscilla and Aquila um, making tents. And we've even taken that terminology for our missionaries, haven't we, of tent making. Um, so he's making stuff. So there's a model in, in the New Testament um, for finance, which is a mixture of giving, sharing, and making. But really, those are things that come. I think it's interesting that the, the, the treatment of how you do finances comes after the death and res resurrection of Christ, not before it, in the kind of chronology of what we're taught when. Um, so that's a background to the, to the five capitals. And I, I wanted to just dig slightly more into those and, and, um, and what they look like and, and when we kind of work those out ourselves. But um, any, any questions or kind of thoughts, reflections on that um, before we move on, Kevin? Yeah, I like the, um, the sense of the ordering or the working out in the ministry of Jesus, spiritual, relational. I was wondering, uh, in terms of the physical, uh, were, did you, uh, in terms of fleshing that out, in terms of how, how you see that in uh, Jesus' uh, ministry, was, was that related to, you know, being concerned for people's uh, physical well-being, healing, and... I think and, that's uh, absolutely that, that true as well. Of, yeah, that's good. And things like where he says, now come away and rest. You know, so he's, he starts to attend. Once they get really busy, he starts to try... He goes to quite, quite long lengths, doesn't he, to give 
rest to the uh, disciples. Like um, after the feeding of 5,000, he kind of said, I mean, my paraphrase, but he kind of says, um, okay, you guys sail back across the lake. I'll keep them here. And then I'll walk across the lake to join you so that we can get some time off before everybody catches up with us. You know, so he's going to quite long lengths to give them rest, isn't he, at that point? Yes. So I think, I mean, I think for us, um, a physical capital, um, our, it is still our ability to get things done, but um, uh, it definitely includes things like uh, patterns of rest and work, you know, the semicircle in terms of the life shapes tools. And, um, yeah. But also physical fitness and things like that, diet, those are all part of making sure that we're capable of doing the things God's calling us to for the long haul, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, yeah, I uh, appreciate the, the ordering of that and, uh, and the, the financial uh, aspect of that, you know, it does seem, it is highlighted so often in the scriptures, but often as a kind of uh, Lord, issues of lordship and uh, stewardship where you really are testing the spiritual capital, uh, you know, in terms of how you, how, how people will uh, use their finances, uh, whether it's for spiritual and relational uh, gain or, or other things. So, Yeah, and it seems that what Jesus order. is saying with those things is he's basically saying, when you want to, when you want to build capital, invest upwards, not downwards. So, you know, the worst thing you can do is try to use spiritual capital that you've got with people to try and get them to give you more money. That's, that's mm-hmm. not, you know, but using financial capital, like the widow's might, you know, she's put in more than anyone else because she's put in what she had to live on. Um, she's building huge spiritual capital there that Jesus himself has noticed um, by investing the financial capital that she has. Um, and I think the, the, the parable of the shrewd manager is interesting, isn't it? Because, um, you know, even though he's dishonest, what Jesus is saying is good is that he's realized that relational capital is worth more than financial capital. And so he's in, even though he's doing it dishonestly, he's investing the financial capital he has responsibility for to gain more relational capital for himself. Um, which uh, Jesus says, you know, make sure that you've got friends welcoming you into your houses when you get to heaven kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of so there seems to be this big thing about invest upwards, you know, rather than trying to invest it, invest into getting the lower capsules. Um, I see. So that's quite challenging for us, isn't it? Because the thing is, the world would say that um, finance is the most important, um, and then qualifications and your intellect is, and even the church would say that often. You know, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, there are many churches that wouldn't employ someone um, who didn't at least have a a master's in, in theology, um, and that would be a more important credential to them than whether they actually was, were living out the things that they're, that they're teaching, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and, and the other thing I've noticed is that that financial first model is also the way that institutionalized thinking works. So, for example, if as a church you feel that God is calling you to um, move into a new building, say, If you're thinking institutional in an institutionalized way, the first question will be, have we got enough money? How are we going to raise the funds? Yeah. Whereas if you're thinking in an apostolic way, the first thing you'll be asking is, has God really said that? You know, what are the promises that God's given us? What's the vision that he's given us for the building? Where is, where is that going to be? And then the the next question would be, who are the core people that are involved in this process that we're going to be, you know, fighting this battle of faith? And, and where are the relationships that are going to make this possible and so on, you know, and you work down. It's not that you never deal with finance, <laughs> but that it follows those other things. Whereas uh, if we think in an institutionalized way, we, we start with, have we got enough money? And the second question is, who have we got? Who's got the qualifications that they need, that we need. And um, it just is a, it is a much less effective way of taking spiritual ground, I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, no, that's helpful. Yeah, and, and it's interesting, once you think that way, you can certainly see, I mean, I don't know about you, but organisations I've been in, I can see times where we've slipped into thinking in an institutionalised way rather than in a spiritual way about the thing, even in churches, about the things that we've been called to do by God. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, um, so in terms of, um, in terms of uh, 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 church leadership, the other thing I would say is that with that shift of 
um, so, of um, social contract, um, there's a big change that's going on there is that we've tended until now to, um, to primarily appoint people um, based on their intellectual capital. Yeah, so does this person, so the reason that I can be the leader of the church is because um, I know more about the Bible than anybody else does. And, uh, and one of the things that we're trying to do um, with 3DM is we're trying to move, we're trying to move to a model. I'm just going to put these arrows on here. I know that you guys have got something going on there, that's fine, but because we're recording this, I'm just going to keep going um, for a while. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. So, um, so we tend to, in churches, employ pastors based on whether they know the Bible better than everybody else, rather than whether they're actually living the life that they're talking about. And so uh, that's a real challenge for the, uh, for the evangelical church, I think, in the, uh, in the West, is that we mm -hmm. need to actually start to employ people based on uh, spiritual capital, rather than based on um, intellectual capital. Uh, not that intellectual capital is unimportant, it's just not the most important thing. Um, so in terms of, in terms of uh, the kind of things that we'll be talking about with spiritual capital, for me, uh, we're talking about um, things like um, a balance of up, in, out. Um, we're talking about uh, family on mission as a lifestyle. Um, we're talking about, um, when I say up and out, that means the person has got, somebody who's got a lot of spiritual capital has a rich and deep devotional life. That's the upward dimension. You know, they're committing time to it. They're spending time with the Lord regularly. They have a good prayer life. They, they're digging into God's word, those sorts of things. The inward dimension is they're, they're strongly practicing hospitality. They're not using their home as a castle and a retreat for ministry. Um, it's not that they don't need times of retreat and times of um, rest. Of course they do, and they, they make sure they factor those things into their week. But the home um, partly is a tool, a vehicle for uh, mission and discipleship. And so they have people in their home, they do community with others. But one of the things that we did, um, you know, when we moved to Fort Wayne, um, my wife and I and our two girls, uh, the church were very kind to us. They wanted to honour us and bless us. And so they got, they got us a house to rent in, um, in a really nice neighbourhood. So uh, I don't know what house prices are like up where you guys are. Here in Fort Wayne, they're very cheap. It's one of the cheapest house, house mm. prices in America. So, um, uh, you know, they, they, um, we, we, didn't, we didn't know what we were coming to. So we just came with kind of suitcases. And um, we drove up to the home that the church had prepared for us. And it was a... It was a three and a half thousand square foot home with a triple garage on three quarters of an acre of land on a golf course, um, you know, with community swimming pool and tennis courts and the whole thing with them. And we roll up, it's like the American dream, and we roll up and there's this big sign saying, welcome home, McConaughey's. It was amazing. So to start mm -hmm. with, we loved that. We loved all the little walking paths on the neighborhood and all that. But then we started to practice the people of peace principle that, um, you know, uh, the Bible teaches us in Luke 10 i.e. start by casting the net wide, just go and knock on doors. So all we did was we went around the neighbourhood, went to the other houses, knocked on the door and said, hey, we just wanted to introduce ourselves, we're your new neighbours. Usually there was a little interested conversation about our English accent. But um, it quickly became apparent as we did that, that none of our neighbours were interested in building any kind of long-term relationship because people don't buy houses in that kind of neighbourhood because they want lots of community with their neighbours. They buy houses in that neighbourhood because they want privacy. And so... The, the most that people wanted was to kind of, you know, wave in a friendly way at each other for their ride on lawnmowers on a Saturday morning, you know. Um, so yeah. we, we worked hard at that. And for about 18 months, we tried to build relationships with our neighbours so that we could um, share Jesus with them and share our lives with them. And there was just nothing. People just were not open to it at all. So, you know, what does, what does the Luke 10 passage say? It says, if, if, a, if a town doesn't receive you, shake the dust off your feet and go somewhere else. So we started asking around, um, uh, you know, whether there were neighbourhoods around where people uh, were able to do community. And some friends of ours in the church said, well, we're in a much more kind of down market neighbourhood than where you guys are at the moment. Um, the houses are smaller and much closer together. But um, we've got about nine families that we've become friends with. And there's a great sense of community, but none of them actually know the Lord. 
Uh, some of them go to church occasionally, but we still don't think they actually know the Lord. And um, we've never been able to bring anybody to Christ. Um, we just don't know how to do that. So would you consider helping us? So we, we met with them and we prayed together at their home. And we said, Lord, if you want us to do this, then a house needs to become available in this neighborhood. And uh, in their street, there hadn't been a house sale since 2009. So it didn't look very likely. And uh, we prayed that. And um, three days later, the house next door to them came up for sale. And so we, we bought the house next door, we moved in, and we've been with, li living here now for about 18 months. And um, we started a missional community together. And it's been slow work. I mean, we've had three or four uh, families coming uh, fairly regularly on Fridays. Um, we've, had, we've only had one child and one adult come to faith so far, but that's still a big difference from what they've seen before. You know, both of them fantastic mm -hmm. kind of stories. And uh, we've got people coming regularly and beginning to learn how to pray and all those sorts of things. So um that would be an example to me of building spiritual capital in in terms of the 3dm dna because you know when i'm preaching on a sunday um, i'm not preaching from theory i'm talking about what we're actually doing and um we're able to share those things and it's not complicated and i'm not a super you know holy guy I, you know i'm a i'm an appetite guy i would say so i you know eat too much and i have all sorts of temptations in my life all those sorts of things but the point is that um, we're, we're focused on living an authentic life of family on mission um, in all three dimensions, up in and out. We pray together, we, you know, we do community, we, we can tell you who our people of peace are, we can tell you who the people are we're trying to bring to Christ. We're in a daily battle for their souls. Um, and so what that's doing is it's developing a spiritual capital that that means that when you teach on these things, you actually have a spiritual authority because you're teaching from your own life as Paul says, you know, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So that there's that kind of dynamic of uh, spiritual capital. So that's really what we're talking about there. And I think that that is something that is missing as a basic understanding of this should be the primary credential of someone who's going to lead a church. Is it someone who models to everybody else the kind of lifestyle that we're supposed to be living? I think mm -hmm. most churches don't want that, actually. I, they find that a bit too challenging. Most churches want someone who's a great Bible scholar and a good teacher who can just, you know, inform them about the things that Jesus said in a really interesting and profound way every week. You know, that's what pe a lot of people want. So I think there's a real challenge for us there. Um, any, any, any reflections on that spiritual capital piece, Kevin, before we, we move on? Uh, no, I just really... Uh echo that and I, I think it is uh, the case that particularly in the, in the Western world um, of, uh, like you said, the expectations of the leader um, maybe are more of their, like you said, uh, ability to take the Bible and talk about it. And um, I find for myself the greatest challenge is that the the uh, rhythms or the the mold that you're working within um, it's very very difficult to break out and you know really have significant time involved in mission and being someone that was a missionary church planning urban poor context in uh, in Asia for 25 years it's just so different being here and uh, it's like you know that's one of the things we're struggling with how do we really uh, stop simply talking about these things and how can we um, walk journey together and living out and being involved in uh, connecting with people outside of our own church and uh, great uh, really a uh, great challenge you know that almost have to restructure the church and and how we you know organize our time and the way we organize uh, the purpose of our meetings so well, I mean, we're kind of coming to the end of the webinar, so I'm not going to go through in that much detail with through all the other capitals. We've talked about what Jesus did with them. But I would say with what you're talking about there, um, the kind of model that we would talk about with 3DM, which is really developing the people of peace strategy. So that's the relational capital. Mm -hmm. um, the, way I, the way to me Jesus um, did that was um, you could draw it a bit like a, um, a funnel. So, um, you know, Jesus is teaching to the crowds, he's teaching to large numbers of people, and he's doing it from the base of the spiritual capital that he has developed. Um, mm -hmm. And then in that context, I mean, in a way, it's the same thing as what he tells them to do when he sends them out in Luke 10. Uh, in that context, 
he says casting the nets wide that's like the wide end of the funnel and then as time's going on he's gradually increasing um he's gradually increasing the um let me just put that to Mary. Uh, the um, invitation and challenge I mean, some of the challenge he gives to Peter, for example, is very extreme, isn't it? When he says, get behind me, Satan, and all that kind of thing. Um, mm. But that's later on when Peter's, you know, bought. So this is kind of, um, if you like, cast nets wide. Um, and then this is kind of increase invitation and challenge. Um, and... And that's that kind. Of, that's this this kind of next bit of the funnel, and then the straight bit of the funnel. Really, that's where now you've got people who've kind of made the commitment that they're going to follow you. So you've kind of got a team at that point, and at that point you start to, you know, work with them and show them what to do. So in a church setting, um, we, what we're talking about in the, with the 3DM uh, DNA is really we're talking about revolutionary change in a church, but we're talking about it at a evolutionary pace. If you try and just change everything overnight, you'll just have a fight on your hands and, um, you know, it all goes wrong. So mm -hmm. the way that we do the evolutionary pace is we tend to talk about some of these things in the front, you know, share some of these things, have, do some things yourself that you can reflect on with everybody. Um, and you throw that out to everybody. That's the wide end of the funnel. But then what you're doing is you're looking for <coughs> the few who respond um, and get excited about it. So, you know, um, there'll be some people who come back to you and say, oh, I really found that inspiring. I, I, I'd love to do some of that stuff myself. You're, you're just throwing out enough of what it is that God's given you that um, it enables you to identify the people who welcome you, listen to you, and serve you. And to some extent, the whole church will, or you wouldn't be the pastor. But what I mean is they welcome you, listen to you, and serve you as you articulate your vision to go deeper into mission and discipleship. You know? So, I mean, you're a missionary in your training and a church church planter and a missionary Kevin and um, really I mean the the vision for me and any church I was in would be you can't distinguish between being a Christian and being a missionary actually every Christian should be a missionary that is the normal Christian life and um, if the people in the church I lead aren't living that way then that's a discipleship issue for me because it's like you know they should be living in community they should be doing mission um, but in kind of suburban American culture suburban Midwestern culture people are so crazy busy um, and and they're, they're really crazy busy because they haven't put the big rocks in the jar first. You know, they haven't started with the priorities that, um, that, that Jesus would want to give them. They've started with the same priorities that the prevailing culture has. So the prevailing culture, for example, has a priority on your kids being good enough at sport to get a college scholarship. So everybody runs after sending their kids to sport um, four or five times a week. And the Christians just do exactly the same as everybody else. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with sport. You could do an amazing, amazing work of missionary work within the sport world. But, um, but, but have they started with the top priorities? Have they started by working out as a family how they pray together? Have they started by working out how they create space in their week so that they can invite friends to spend time with them have they, and have fellowship with other Christians? Are they, are they putting things... You know, the, the, the analogy of the rocks in the jar. You know, if you have pebbles and gravel and sand and you need to fit it all in the jar if you put the, the pebbles and the if you put the gravel and the sand in first you'll never get all the pebbles in if you put mm -hmm. the pebbles in first then you can fit the gravel and the sand around them and um so so um you know one of the real challenges for people um in churches is they've they've put the wrong rocks in the jar first and then they can't fit everything in you know and um, mm -hmm. they've often never most you get very committed very mature christian families who've never actually make intentional decisions about how they use their time for example they just do it the same way that everybody else does and um, mm. it's a huge issue so you cast your net wide you start talking about some of these things you bring some of the challenges you tell some of the stories and you say who are the people that welcome me listen to me and serve me as i do this and then you begin to invite them into closer things so that's one of the things that we would use huddle for um, the tool of huddle um, uh, you know where you start to do discipleship groups with people where perhaps once a week or on every other week or whatever you gather and you're really um, saying, how's God getting my attention? And then using discussion to ask the question from that, how's God getting my attention to work out together with others, what's God saying to me and then holding each other accountable that you actually do it. So what's my plan? 
and in two weeks' time, you're going to hold me accountable about whether I did this plan or not. You know, that, that's one of the models that we have. That's the basic model of a huddle. And it's designed to help people to um, follow the leading of the Spirit, obviously within a biblical framework, but follow the leading of the Spirit and actually do what God's saying rather than just putting it on the back burner. You know, three years later, we still haven't done it and wondered why we don't seem to be growing spiritually. So, so mm-hmm. that, that's the kind of thing that you start doing by inviting people that seem to respond to the kind of wide netcast that you do. And eventually you get to the point where you get some people where you can enter a more formal discipleship relationship with like a huddle. You say, well, I'd like to work with you for the next year and really process it together. And the, the end goal wouldn't just be that you're more informed. The end goal would be that you're moving into a family or mission lifestyle or maybe even starting a missional community. I mean, I don't mind which, but that you're basically, my aim is to help you to learn to live like a missionary in our, in our kind of whatever, our suburban or our urban or whatever um, 21st century American environment. So, mm-hmm. so, you know, at that point, most of the people in the church wouldn't be responding to that. And you're just getting on with teaching everybody some general stuff, you know, trying to help everybody to grow a little bit in, up, in and out. We try to help everybody to move on a bit. But you've got a core team of people, the relational capital, who you're really going deeper with and you're taking them deeper with it. And then as they begin to get it, then you'll start training them to do the same so that it multiplies, like when Jesus went from the 12 to the 72. So then you start to increase your physical ability to do things in the, in the church. And, um, and as you begin to get people implementing it, that's when you start to do lots of kind of uh, more formal training of people because now you've got enough people that it's actually worth doing some training. And so you kind of, that's, that's how we kind of work through the five capitals in that kind of order. Mm-hmm. So I don't know whether that's a helpful concept, but that's kind of what we call the people of peace uh, principle. We, t- we usually use a, that funnel to kind of describe it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, any reflections on that from you, Kevin? Uh, no, again, uh, Bill, how fun. Uh, yeah, I think in, in our own particular case, being kind of at the beginning end of uh, introducing, you know, it's, uh, those are good words about the order of change or, uh, you know, how to introduce change in, in a... In Revolutionary a, in change at an evolutionary pace. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, what things, uh, that's how getting, uh, uh, starting to get some sense of the kinds of things that would be good to talk about uh, with the, with the, you know, with the crowd or the, the people that uh, uh, want to want to learn, and then uh, you know to kind of whet people's appetite or get a sense of that. But then uh, over time, as you were saying, uh, trying to develop who are the you know, core people that um, want to really go forward in it. Yeah, and I, I think that actually the skill of being a missional pastor of a church. Um, is that we have to, it's a bit like, you know, when you, you tap your head and rub your stomach, you know, trying to do two things at once, it's hard, but we almost have to have like a slow track and a fast track running at the same time, don't we? Where on the one hand, we're helping everybody to move on a little bit, but at the same time, we're identifying the people who are prepared to go ahead and show everyone else what's possible. And we're making sure that we're putting some of our time aside to really invest into them so that there's a kind of vision for the church of what could be. And I think that's one of the challenges is to do both of those things at the same time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great. Well, I'm, I, I'm, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I'm aware that we've, been, we've, gone, for, we've gone for a good kind of hour and 10 minutes. But um, any, other, any other comments or questions or thoughts? Um, I, I, I'd imagine you weren't planning for it to be a one-on-one webinar that you're coming into, but I appreciate you coming in. And, uh, oh, yeah. Well, that's, uh, it's, thank you for your time and going ahead and uh, doing this. And uh, that's a uh, really good start. And uh, and uh, so I'll, I'll be taking this and then beginning to uh, kind of consulting with Gina as well. And uh, as kind of looking at those first steps, things I can introduce even to our small groups or in teaching sessions. Uh, so we start introducing some of these things. Wonderful. So I well, I, I hope, hopefully I'll connect with you at some point while you're on the journey, Kevin. It'll be yes. good to uh, meet you again. And uh, I hope you guys manage to get, if they get that learning community going, I might be involved at some point in it. So I'll hopefully meet you again at some point. But thank you for coming on today. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Okay. God bless. Yeah. Bye now. Bye.